people! Welcome once again to the Party of One podcast, where the gaming table is always set for two. I am your host as always, Jeff Stormer. This week I am joined by Senda, one of the hosts of She's a Super Geek and Panda's Talking Games, for a game of Cthulhu Confidential by Pelgrane Press. She's a Super Geek is a phenomenal action level play which highlights women as GMs, and Panda's Talking Games is a discussion podcast with Senda and Phil Vecchione talking about various aspects of tabletop role-playing games. They're both fascinating, they're both wonderful, and you should check them both out. Links can be found in the show notes. Cthulhu Confidential is the first installment in Pelgrain Press's Gumshoe 1 to 1 series. It is about a lone investigator unraveling a mystery of Lovecraftian proportions. As you can probably imagine, I have been dying with excitement for Gumshoe 1 to 1 since, honestly, before Party of One started. It has been years in the making, and it has been on the top of my wish list for a very long time. So I am dying with excitement to get to this game, and I cannot wait to share it with you. It was a real good one. But before we dive in, I have a few pieces of house cleaning to take care of. First, a special thank you going out to Troy Pitchelman for being our latest backer on Patreon. Troy, your support of the show means a great deal. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Secondly, I have a few words to say. Mm-hmm. It's a s- scary time. Mm-hmm. It's been a scary couple weeks, scary couple months. It's been scary for a very long time, and I am scared. And my friends are scared, and my loved ones are scared, and you're probably scared too. And in the last couple weeks, months, whatever, I've been honestly wondering what even the point was of doing a show like Party of One when our fundamental freedoms are under attack. It just... What was the point of it all? But the truth is, this is a way for my voice to be heard as a queer man living with depression and anxiety. This is a way for me to be heard, and God damn it, I'm going to be heard. So I'm calling on you, as listeners of Party of One, if you enjoy this show, if you enjoy what this is, if you enjoy the thing that this has been for the last year and a half, then I urge you to fight for myself and for people that I love and for my friends and family and loved ones and Call your representatives. Donate time and money where you can to organizations like Planned Parenthood and the ACLU. Support the marginalized voices in your community. Reject the hateful and harmful voices in your community. And just be the person that we need you to be right now. You can do this. We can do this. I believe in you. And I'm right there with you. And if my... Playing a silly role-playing game once a week helps lift the burden a little bit, like it does for you, like it does for me, then, well, I'm alright with that. You can find some links in the show notes to support all that stuff. Now let's play a game. Let's, let's have some fun. Let's throw it over to me in the past so that he can get started with the show. Take it past me. Thanks, future me. This week, my guest is Senda. Senda, thank you for coming on Party of One. Absolutely, I am thrilled to be here. So, uh, at the top of the show, why don't you take a moment and tell, uh, talk about where people might know you from, talk about what you've got going on you might want the listeners to know about, any podcasts you might be a part of, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, well, there's a couple. Um, so, I do She's a Super Geek with my best friend, Emily, um, and it is a live play, or actual play is what people are calling it these days. It is an actual play RPG podcast where we highlight women as GMs, and what that means is uh, sometimes Emily or I is running a game, sometimes we bring in um, other gals to run games, and uh, basically we just always have somebody who identifies as female running a game which is awesome. Uh, I also do Pandas Talking Games with Phil Vecchione, who's my other best friend. And uh, we talk about one shots and campaigns and answer listener questions in a theoretically short form podcast, which usually hits about 45 minutes long. <laughs> yep. Um, you know, good short podcast you know, is about 45 minutes. I, I feel right. that. I feel like it's a Vecchione short form with bunny ears around it, because for him, that is short. <laughs> Fair. I really like she's a super geek. I've I've said well, it before, but I'm you. a big fan. I, I I'm a big fan. Uh yeah, it's we're we're gonna hit two years pretty shortly here, actually, which is really exciting. Um Yeah, it's been great. And uh I do also write for Gnome Stew when I am good enough to get my articles in, which I need to do again. <laughs> but um so you can find me all over the place. <laughs> I, Did I, I cover I know everything? That feel. I think I covered everything. I think so. I know, I know that, I know that busy life. I know, I know, I know that million yes. projects feel. <laughs> so this week we are playing Cthulhu Confidential. It is the first game in the Gumshoe One to One system by Pelgrane Press. I am tremendously excited. It is a game that has been 
talked about and in development, I think slightly longer than Party of One has been a thing, and I've been waiting for it with bated breath ever since then, and I'm super excited to give it a shot. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, why don't you talk about the character you're going to be playing this week, and give them a nice introduction for the listeners at home. Yeah, so um, my name is Vivian Sinclair. I am an investigative journalist. Um, I am really, I will do just about anything for the story. Um, I'm especially into, um, revealing corruption, um, finding crimes and basically, um, revealing, shining a light on some of the, the parts of the city's underbelly that a lot of people don't look into very closely because I think it's really important for, um, uh, people to know what's going on in this area. Um, and I will pretty much follow a lead through to its conclusion, um, even at great personal, personal risk. That's a, that's, that's a really great quality that I don't think is going to, I don't think is going to come back to haunt you at all. Oh, in this not particular at all. Scenario. I think this is great. <laughs> so Manny Trota, society paper writer for the Herald Tribune. Manny Trota was an odd fellow. He was energetic. He was lively. He was, uh, he was young. Like, he was young. He was fit. He never drove a day in his life. He always said, my legs can take me anywhere that I need to go. He always said, you can find me, you can find me in a car over my dead body. Which made the fact that he was found in a car wreck about a block away from the Herald Tribune office immediately suspicious. Something didn't, something wasn't right about that. You find yourself with a few other Herald Tribune writers around the scene of where it happened. It happens about 9.15 in the morning is when word gets out about it. And it's only about a block away. So you find yourself there and things don't add up. But let me ask you, what was your, what was your relationship like with Manny? Um, it was, it was up and down. It was occasionally rocky, but you know what? I, uh, I always respected his journalism even when we weren't getting along personally. It was very important to me. He was a good guy. He was, a, he, was, he was odd, but he had a good heart. Yes. And you're standing here, you're looking at this, like, head-on car collision. And immediately a few things don't add up. You, the, there are a few police officers on the scene, like, kind of, like, corralling the crowd a little bit. But they are keeping people, they're being more aggressive than a cops would normally be about, like, an ordinary auto accident. They're, like, actively telling people they need to leave and, like, kind of getting hand, like, getting handsy with people, kind of shoving them a little bit. Uh, the two things that you notice immediately, based on your skill of evidence collection and photography, you've got mm -hmm. an eye for, like, you've got an eye for a scene, basically, is it's a head-on collision, but there's no skid marks on either car. So, like, nobody, it... it it doesn't seem like anybody tried to stop the cars, which immediately said, like feels odd if it yes. was like a spin-out situation. And the police are, are shoving people and getting real, like, sort of mouthy and handsy about it. But, and they're like, oh, it's a grisly scene. It's a grisly scene. Nobody wants to see this. But you're, you're looking around and as morbid as it sounds, you don't see any blood. It's almost as though, like, this grisly scene, it, but it's shockingly clean. You're there with a few other Herald Tribune writers. Um, Editor-in-Chief Duke English is sort of standing nearby. You can recognize Captain Janice Dole is an officer you've, you've, you've met and encountered a few times before. She's kind of poking around, talking to a few officers. She has a concerned look on her face. You also see Commissioner Chet Fletcher is walking around, which is odd because why would a police commissioner be here at this time in warning for what is seemingly an ordinary auto accident? Well, I absolutely need to get to the bottom of this clearly. Um, clearly there's something going on. And whether it's corruption or something else, I mean, corruption is the only thing I can really imagine right now. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to get anything directly from any of these officers, but maybe while they're distracted by um, trying to keep all the other people from seeing what's going on, I can get through and just see if I can get a glimpse of what's happening. And if they catch me, well... Whatever, um, you know, I'll just ask Janice and see if I can get some more information from her at that point. But I think I should probably see if I can get an actual image of what's happening before I make myself known. Okay. Um, then what we'll do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for a quick challenge. Mm-hmm. 
uh, and we'll introduce sort of the, the, the two core mechanics of Gumshoe 1 to 1. Okay. So what you're going to do is, um, the first of the, first of the two core mechanics in Gumshoe 1 to 1 is you're going to make a challenge, which you're going to make a, roll, a stealth roll. Mm-hmm. So you'll have some dice next to your skill noted as stealth on your character sheet. Uh, it'll, it should have a number of d6 listed on it. I have one d6. You're gonna roll that number of uh, you're gonna roll that number of six-sided dice. Okay. You want to get at least a. You want to get a three plus to get an advantage, a hold on a two plus, which is not an advantage, but it gets you what you want, and a setback on a one, which is a problem card. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> the first roll of the game is a two. Okay. So, yeah, the cops are distracted. They're trying to corral people. Uh, The other reporters are trying to get a sight on things, and you kind of slip by without a problem. Yes. You don't get any particular, like, you're, you're, like, you can tell you're a little bit on their radar, but uh, I'm going to say that, like, Janice kind of sees you a little bit Mm -hmm. and kind of, like, turns away a little bit, like, gives you a a light side eye, but is going to let you do what you need to do. Right. So I've got my notebook that is always in the pocket of my trench coat immediately is in my hand. And I'm thumbing very quickly to the next available page and pulling the pencil from behind my ear as I'm walking. Okay, yeah. So the other core mechanic of Gumshoe 1 to 1 is your investigative abilities. Uh, the way that they work is you simply ask if, if you're like you ask or describe how you use your investigative abilities and any clues in the scene, I give them to you based on those abilities. So you are not okay. going to miss any clues if you use uh, by using your skills. Okay. That's that's the way that the game approaches mysteries, which I think is really neat. It's brilliant. The other way that the other the other thing that you have is four pushes. The way that okay. works is you can use a push for a skill, and you could get pushes later on in the game through challenges. But the way that works is, say you want to use. Um, um, the skill that probably won't come here is your cryptography skill. Mm-hmm. You can use your push and say, like, I find extra information through cryptography, and then I give you some really valuable information that will help, that will definitively help you later on. Okay. So you have a few moments of, like, super clarity to bank as needed. Right. But in the meantime, you can just ask me questions about the, the scene of the crime. You can ask me questions about, like, using your abilities, all that kind of stuff. Investigate the scene as you will. Right. So I want to go up to the car that Manny is in. Right. And uh, the first thing that I feel like I need to do is pick out, um, just specifically jot down any evidence that I see about what was going on. So I'm noting things like there are no skid marks and looking for other things like that. Like I said, yeah, you, you notice there are no skid marks. You notice that there's no, there's no like... There's no blood. There's no. It's. It sort of seems like the cars just went straight at each other. You notice. Um. You're kind of poking around. You notice something kind of at your feet. You kind of touch it. You pick it up. It is a piece of, like brick. It is like a red, like building brick. And you poke yeah. around. You see a little bit more of it, and you find a fairly sizable chunk, sort of near, a, a small hole in the driver's side door, and. It seems an awful lot like somebody put a brick on the gas pedal. Huh. Of the car that Manny the car that Manny was in, I should say. Sure. And so I have an immediate suspicion because I would never have expected Manny to be in a car ever that there was already something terribly wrong with him um by the time he was in this car, whether that means that he was not conscious in some way or was possibly already dead. So I, gosh, is there, can I, um, sorry, I'm looking, I'm staring at my list is what's happening. Um, can I also look in the other car? Is there anyone in that other car? You actually, you peek in the other car. You walk over and sure enough, there's no one in this other car. Oh. It's, it's dead empty. And you're not, you don't see, uh, like there's an ambulance on the scene, but you haven't seen a stretcher come out. You saw the ambulance pull up, and you haven't seen the stretcher come out, and, like, the doors are still closed, and they're still, like, get figuring out, like, they're still, like, talking to the police and stuff to figure out, like, what they need to do. But this right. car's empty. This car's empty, and Manny is dead, and that's all there is. Interesting. So, 
Oh, <laughs> the mystery <laughs> defense. Oh, the plot thickens. Okay. I think what this point I will do, I'm going to do... So I'm going to jot down these notes really quickly in my notebook that sure. I've got out, and then I'm going to hide it away in my pocket, and I want to actually go approach Janice. Okay. Janice greets you with a wry smile. She's like, she she kind of, she sees, she sees you stash the notepad. She's like, you're on, on the job already. You're faster than I've heard. You know, what can I say? It's, uh, it's just what I do. It's really important to me. Uh, the people need to know the truth. Um, eh, I respect that about you. Sure. There's some, you know, there's some weird things about this, right? I mean, you're a very smart woman and I, I really respect your policing and, um, you know, I, I think you've always done a wonderful job on every case that I've, I've ever been involved with you on, um, even though we've, we've sort of passed ships a lot. Um, can you give me a little more information about what actually happened here? So I'm trying to use flattery to collect some yeah, more information. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> she, she, she is very, pre- she immediately kind of blushes. She blushes and she, she smiles and she kind of like, um, sort of like turns away from the crowd a little bit. And she's like, I don't, I don't know, something, something happened. Manny, obviously, something's not right with this crime scene. Like, obviously, there's no one in that other car. Yeah. But the other cops are, I mean, the commish is here, and that's not normal. No. Like, why would he be, like, something is up. I don't know what yet. And she gives you a card with her num like with her office phone on it, and she's like, "Something is up. If you have, if you can find any information about this, let me know." And I, cause I, I got nothing. All I know is that somebody staged this, and I'm I want to get to the bottom of it. Right. And as she's talking, um, like the commissioner, you see, uh, Fletcher get into a car and drive off with a few, like, and the only people left are Janice and a few like junior cadet officers interesting (laughs) all right so and are they still keeping people away yeah they're still like shuffling people away uh you see duke english your editor-in-chief sort of he starts to wave you down he 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 waves you over and he smiles and he says uh look congrats i know you've been angling for a promotion now you got now you got the society pages and whatever weird whatever weird muckrake and beat you want to run normally yeah well, thanks. I mean, it's uh, it's great, but um, aren't you kind of worried about Manny? Like what happened here? That's this is really concerning. You don't think? He stares off into the middle distance, and he just says, "There's no story here. He was he was stupid and reckless, and he did something that he knew would get him hurt. Like he he knew he didn't have a driver's license. He wasn't a driver. He knew if he got behind a car." That something would happen. And he stares off in that middle distance for a while. And you can tell something is real. So you can tell something is off really? with him. Yeah. Duke, you you doing okay? Maybe, uh, look, we can, uh, we can go back to your office. I know you keep that bottle of whiskey in your bottom drawer. We could, we could just toss one back here. I mean, this is a little shocking. Yeah, let's let's do that. So he takes you go back to his office. We cut to his office. Yeah, <laughs> he's they, the whiskey's between you. It's half empty yep. at this point. It's yes. a good morning. It's a good Tuesday morning. He's been drinking a lot more of it than me. <laughs> and he just smiles at you and he says, "Look, Viv, I I like you. You're a good kid. You got a good heart. But this one's a lost cause. Let it go." Hey, Duke, I mean, you know me. It, it, it's not about if it's lost or not. There's a cause, right? You, uh... I tell you what. Do me a solid. You tell me what happened, because I think you know more than you've been letting on, and if you tell me, then I will think about letting it go. And he, his hand starts to shake, and he starts to, um... His eyes water a little bit, and he starts to shake, and he kind of, like, holds that glass of whiskey, and it starts to rattle with the ice in it. And he says, I can't. It was an accident. It was just an accident. It was just an auto accident. Those things happen. I, look, he didn't, what, he was probably just scared because of that, 
that interview that he did with the the Saint Swithins. What I don't remember. Whatever the the business guy's name, the weird one. He was probably just shaken up about that. That interview that he did. But don't go looking. Don't go looking into it, please. You're a good kid, and he kind of like shuffles you out of his office. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Saint Swivens, huh? You can spend a push to know more about that if you'd like. Um, you know what? I will. Yes. Okay. I would love to. Um, you, Manny's told you about this interview that he had lined up. He had a remarkably weird story pop up with an Alistair Saint Swithens, a local um, eccentric business person. One of the, the like, the, the upper, the Wall Street elites. Apparently, Alistair St. Swithins snapped and tried to eat his limo driver. Like, just ran at her and tried to eat her. Whoa. Started screaming, screaming gibberish, and just ran at her. And he had actually lined up an interview from the, uh, from, like, from prison. That, or, yeah, from, like, the holding facility. That was, he was going to actually get, get the first ever interview with Alistair St. Swithins since this weird incident. But that was the last you'd heard about it. And that was a few days ago. You'd heard, you know that his interview was scheduled for Friday. But that was the, but you had last you heard from him was Friday afternoon. Before the interview. Right. And it's the weekend. So, you know, it wouldn't have been that unusual, except that now it seems like it. Um, I would love to do some research and see if I can figure out where okay. they are holding this Alistair St. Swivens. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, you... I might have to make some phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> well, you first off, you stop by his desk. You stop by Manny's desk, and there's a oh, yeah. swarm of Herald Tribune writers picking it apart, stealing office supplies, that sort of thing. It's the newspaper right. business. I it's want, a dirty game. I want, I want his notes, if they're still yeah, there. So they are. They are. There's actually, um, people are sort of brushing them off because they don't need, we, they need like, they need the, the fresh notebooks and pencils. Nobody mm-hmm. wants his old busted notes. Yeah. So you grab his notebook. You flip through it. Mm-hmm. You, um, you find the, the contact information for the, uh, for the, uh, the prison. Mm-hmm. You find like a phone number and address. Uh, the time and date of his scheduled interview was like Friday at 6.30 p.m. And... You start seeing notes from the interview itself, and they start getting, uh, like, he starts taking notes, they start out normal, and they really quickly turn into what I guess I would, dis- like, short, like, a really weird shorthand, almost as though, like, he had started consciously writing them so that only he would understand them. Interesting. So I want to take this back to my desk and sit down with it for a little while. Sure. I'm hoping maybe I can sit down and crack his code. Yeah. So you sit down with it. You spend some time with it. You you start writing things out. The thing, the like, you start figuring out like the shorthand abbreviations, and it's they're weird. They're not normal. It's not normal shorthand. Like he specifically is abbreviating things in a way that doesn't quite make sense. He's kind of switching back and forth between like English and Spanish. So you have to pull out a dictionary a few times and like figure things out. Sure. Yeah. It's and he starts making notes about like he's just rambling. He's talking nonsense. You see the word. Krakatoa written a few times and you see the name Goodman written out a bunch and he just starts writing these things out and he starts like making question marks of like Goodman active like and he starts writing out other names and they're names that you recognize from the society pages and he starts like underlining them or crossing them out and it's this very there's a lot of of, like, he's writing out all these names, and Goodman keeps coming up, and Krakatoa keeps coming up. Interesting. And um, you get the, there's a, there's a business, or there's a card on it with a name and a number of Lucy Drummond, in parentheses, driver, and a phone number. All right. Krakatoa, Goodman. Hmm. I'm gonna pull on my big girl reporter shoes <laughs> pick up my desk phone and i'm gonna call lucy drummond okay uh it rings a few times it went a long longer than it probably than, than you would imagine mm-hmm. but uh a young girl in her early 20s answers he- he- hello hi is this lucy drummond who's asking 
I'm Vivian Sinclair. Um, I'm an investigative journalist, and um, I'm just following up on a story that a, a co-worker of mine, Manny, was was writing about, and I found, uh, actually, he, he gave me your card. I was wondering uh, if I could just ask you a couple of questions. Oh, um, yeah, Manny, talk to you. Is he, is he okay? Did he, he didn't, he didn't go talk to Alistair, did he? He, uh, yeah, he did go talk to Alistair. Um, oh, no. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. What do you, what do you, yeah, what do you, what do you need to know? Just, yeah. Can you tell me more about what's going on with Alistair? Um, I'm, I'm unfortunately, look, I, I gotta tell you straight. Manny's dead. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Why did he talk to Alistair? Okay. Yeah. That's... Right. So, um, can you, can you give me any information about what might have happened, um, when he went and talked to Alistair that might have led him to... He probably... I don't... Alistair was weird. That's what I'll tell you. He was a weird guy. He had some He had some weird friends and some weird opinions. But it was always harmless, right? Like, it was always harmless until it wasn't. And I think it... I think that the stuff that they were reading just got into his head. And I think... If Manny talked to him, maybe it got into Manny's head, and maybe Manny tried to do something about it. But I don't know. Like, uh, why did he talk to Alistair? Um, do you know what kind of stuff? Like, what kind of strange stuff were they reading? Oh, I, I, I don't know. He. Okay, I'm gonna tell you this, but understand that I told this to Manny, and look what happened to him. Yeah, I I do understand that. They the day that Alistair at- attacked me, the day that he tried to ki- kill, eat, eat, kill, kill me. He, I'm not gonna buy into the story about it because that's weird. But the day that he tried to attack me, he started just screaming good the name Goodman and saying that his will needed to be done. He just started screaming, "His will be done. Goodman's will be done." And I, I, I looked into it a little bit, and don't don't look into it. It's uh, I mean, it's kind of my job as a journalist to look into this sort of thing. I mean, if you want to just help me on the path a little bit, maybe I can hit a point where I'll, you know, I'll I'll get enough information and then I can drop it. But I I really can't drop it right now. It was. I don't know, some weird cult thing about, like, old weird pilgrim cult that he was that he was reading up on, and it got in his head, and he went crazy. And that's all I know. That's all I know. That's all I found on it, and that's all I know. Was he was reading this Quincy Goodman garbage, and he snapped. Hmm. Well, um... I really appreciate your help. You know, if you think of anything else that that might help out, I'm uh let me just give you my number. You can you can call me anytime day or night. Uh you know, if I'm not at my desk, that's fine because the the secretary up front can take a note for you. Uh okay. I'll I'll do that. Just do me a favor. Be safe. Okay. Uh, you know. Okay. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So she hangs up. I'm so not promising anyone that I'm going to be safe. <laughs> that's fair. No, that's a fair. That's a fair thing to promise. I'm very determined. Quincy Goodman. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Got that. Goodman active. The list of names that are in this notebook that I've um, picked up from Manny's desk. Does this look like people who are all in high society in the city here? Oh, yeah. Like, and... Part of that's not surprising. Right. Because Manny was a society writer. Like, he covered these shindigs and soirees, and that was his scene. Right. So it's not super surprising that he has these notes, but it, within, like, the crypt, the, the encrypted stuff, like, you're seeing a lot of, yeah, a lot of, like, wealthy, old money, old money types. Um, you know, your, uh, your Mary Bellwethers, your Edwin Charles Kincaids, that sort of thing. Sure. Kincaid's name comes up a lot. Okay. Then, uh, see, it is that Quincy Goodman. I wonder how I can get more information about that. Let's see. You, um, could, you could turn to one of your sources. Oh, I have sources, huh? 
<laughs> yeah, sources. Uh, sources in Gumshoe One to One are people that know or people that are specialized in areas that your character might not be. You have a few experts that you know of. Um, so, for instance, you have Stella Abrams. She's an amateur cultist. You also know uh, Professor Annette Nettie Rice, who is. Professor uh, Rice. Uh, she 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 teaches natural science and like she teaches science natural sciences at Hunter College. Uh, Stella Abrams is a media. Uh, she's a medium. She's a like a psychic type. Sure. And she knows a lot of occult things. Right. Sometimes I call her when I just can't get a lead, but yeah. I know that something's fishy, and I try and see if I can get something from her that I can then verify and follow up with in a non-occult way. <laughs> right. 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 So this seems like a really good time to call Stella. Yeah, I'm gonna say. Uh, she actually, your phone rings. My phone. As you're like thinking, <laughs> yeah, your office phone rings and it's oh, Stella. Oh, it must be and she's Stella. Like, you rang. <laughs> yes, hi Stella. Um, long time no talk. Yeah, I figured. I, I figured you were gonna call today. I had a hunch. Yeah, I I know you. <laughs> You do always have a hunch. Hey, um, so I was going to ask you a question. Sure. I'm waiting to see for a second if she already knows what it is. <laughs> no, no, that's about as far as her, uh, that's about as far as her hunches go is that you were going to call. Right. Okay. Um, so I've been hearing a lot of weird rumors going around about this uh, Quincy Goodman fellow who wrote some sort of or was some sort of wrote some sort of weird pilgrim story. Do you have you ever heard of this before? I'm sorry. Did you wh- who did you what was that? I'm so no, you couldn't have. What was that name? Quincy Goodman. Oh. Uh, that's what I thought you said. Okay. Yes, I've I have heard of Quincy Goodman. I have not read any of his books personally because I am not a masochist, but I have heard of him. Quincy was a cult leader. He was a, in the 17, in the sort of old Mayflower days. He was on, he was one of them. He was one of the, the, not the Mayflower, but one of the Mayflower sort. Sure. But he was a, he was an odd man. He was a, a, like a hedonist. He was a, he was, he was a weird, corrupt, old religious soothsayer sort. The name kind of gets bandied about in our circles as a little bit of an insult. It kind of means, like, you're in it for the wrong reasons. Sure. He had a lot of writing about, like, the end of the world and about how to survive we have to we have to bring forth the demons within ourselves. He talked a lot about, like, Krakatoa, the, the, de- the mind demon. The mind which, demon, huh? Yeah, it's... It was a lot of like doomsaying to try and curry political power. I, you're better off not. It's a lot of hateful garbage. Um. Well, hateful garbage or not, it seems to be the lead that I have on this particular case I'm working on right now. The story what, is going what, in some strange that? directions. What do you mean lead? Like, you don't, you don't know people that are reading that stuff, do you? So, uh. You hear about that incident with Alistair St. Swivens and his limo driver? Yeah, I just figured old I just figured rich people are weird. Yeah, I mean they are weird and crazy. I, you're not wrong, but apparently they're weird enough and crazy enough that they've been uh reading these books by Quincy Goodman. Oh. That's Okay, I know that I know that this is going to fall on deaf ears. I know that this is going to fall on deaf ears. <laughs> Because I know you. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be safe. I'm sorry. I was just going to say drop it. (laughs) Well, everybody keeps telling me to be safe and then they tell me to drop it. And man, you know, the moment that starts happening, all I want to do is just write this story, right? Okay, well, then you know what? You know what? You're great. You're a good friend. I love you. You're on your own. Click. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm left holding the phone to my ear and it's and it's just gone to like the, the busy signal going, yeah. Stella? Hello? Stella? 
Okay. <laughs> well then. Um. Okay. Good. Krakatoa. The mind demon. I think I'm going to have to call the prison that has Alistair St. Swivens. Okay. You... If you call up the prison, a guard answers. Uh, you ask about St. Swithin's receptive. They said, yeah, um, I mean, a reporter just came by to talk about him the yeah. other day. Yep, sure. He was he was actually a, a friend of mine. Unfortunately, he's he's been in a really unfortunate accident. I'm I'm actually trying to finish up his story that he was in the middle of writing. It's a, it's really important, uh, just because Alistair Saint Swivens has been a member of the um, you know upper echelon in our city for so long. It's it's really key that we make sure we get the story out. And unfortunately, um, he uh, he wrote his notes very strangely. So I, I was wondering if I might just be able to come in and, and clear a couple of things up uh, in terms of his question answers. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, yeah, you can come on down. Uh, we're, you know, we're, oh, whenever. I mean, we, we're very, we're friendly with the press, so, you know. Yeah, yeah come on yeah, down. No, we, we appreciate it a lot. Thanks. <laughs> so, you make your way to the prison. <laughs> yup. Um, I, before I go. Yeah? I'm going to, um, just really quickly, on my desk, I'm going to pull out a piece of paper. I'm going to write right. down, um kind of all the things that I've noticed so far. I'm going to fold right. the pe- piece of paper up and um, just uh, uh, I'll actually like tape it shut or like staple it. I'll s- seal it shut with a staple um, and just leave it in the center of my desk. Okay. <laughs> like I'm having that moment where I'm like, okay, this is where I think things went really crazy for Manny. I'm just going to bundle all this information up because if someone else ends up following up on this story, <laughs> maybe it will get them a little bit further ahead than I was when I started. So, Sure, sure, um, sure. And with that, I will take my notebook, I'll put my trench coat back on, um, and I will uh, head right back down the hallway and out to, uh, I'm going to head out to the prison. I guess, let's see. My, I don't know if I would have a car or not. I, tell me, the, yeah. what's the era again here? Are we 1920s? 1930s? 30s? Uh, 30, yeah, mid thir- early mid-30s. Right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flag down a taxi. Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we, we flag down a taxi. We, uh, we pan over. Uh, the taxi drives off, and we sideswipe over to the prison. Yes. <laughs> You're sitting across from Alistair St. Swithins. Okay. He is an old white man. Uh, long the hair is gray and matted and long and his beard is long and unkempt and his fingernails are long and grimy and he's just sitting rocking back and forth mumbling this man is clearly disturbed okay is are we like in a room with a table or like glass partition or uh in a room with a table there's a guard and there's a like guard in each corner sure a few other people are having are like talking Okay. And he's just mumbling. He's saying, oh, Goodman's will, Goodman's will, I, he's, he's real, I seen him, he's real, I, Goodman's will be done. Um, Alistair, uh, can you hear me okay? You with me? And he just looks up at you, still mumbling, still mumbling, looking back and forth, but he's looking at you in the eyes and he's not blinking. That's also disturbing. Can you, can you tell me? Who's real? Krakatoa. Krakatoa. He's real. I seen. I seen him. I saw him. I've seen him. He's real. He's real. He's in all of us. He's real. His will be done. And he starts to like rock back and forth a little more violently. And he starts like tapping his fingernails on the table. And he starts like grinding his teeth as he mumbles like, "He's real. He's real. We must feed him. We must feed him." And you have he starts to he starts to like violently rock back and forth. Right. Um, I'm going to actually stand up and push my chair in, but I'm not leaving yet. <laughs> I just want one more thing between me and him. Sure. Um, Alistair, uh, how do you feed Krakatoa? And he stops rocking back and forth. And he looks up at you. Blood. 
And he flips the table. Yes. <laughs> That's where I'm like, <laughs> I didn't want to be sitting down for that. <laughs> you, you made the right call. You made uh, right. a, sensible, I, a sensible decision. I, it's not that I like am scared to follow a story through, but I don't have to be stupid about it. <laughs> right. No, I, you made exactly the right call. Uh, okay. So this is going to be a challenge. Blood. Okay. As he starts to, like, he flips the table and he's getting ready to, like, lunge at you. Yes. Um. You know so what? what do you do? I am. I mean, I have done some. <laughs> I have covered some stories that to get that information, I mean, it would raise your eyebrows. Sure. I, I, I'm actually pretty good at defending myself in the street when I need to. So I think what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to try to block him as he lunges at me. And then I want to see if I can just cold clock him and knock this okay. old guy out. Make me a fighting roll. Oh, yes. Okay. When I roll two dice, do I give you the higher result? Roll them one at a time. Add your total as you go. Yeah. Okay. Seven. Okay. Yeah, you clock him in the jaw, and he goes down, and the guards are on him. They handcuff yeah. him up, they drag him off. Okay. You're okay. Yep. But, uh, okay, you're, you're very, Shaken. very, oh, there are a lot of def definitions of okay. It's a great right. term. <laughs> right. <laughs> you're not hurt, is the thing. But right. he's dragged off. Yes. Um, hmm. Wow. So I, I shake out my hand because that hurt my knuckles a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of gather myself and uh, put my uh, hat back on. <laughs> now I have a hat because hats. Yep. Um, turn down the broom against the rain and head back out. All right. <laughs> hmm. Wow. Feed him with blood. And there was no blood at all in the car accident. There was not. You know, um, I actually, uh, I want to flag down a taxi. I want to head back and I want to want to take a closer look if that accident is still there. I want to see if they've already moved the accident. It's more or less cleared up. If you yeah. spent, uh, you know what, spend me, give me a push. And yeah. I'll say the accident that you've, you've made it back and they are just getting ready to move the, to move the car out of there. Awesome. So you make it back just in time. Just in time. And I'm going to go, Janice, <laughs> you need to give me one moment, please. She, she, she comes over. I just, uh, I just need to look at this for one more second before you clear this out. Do you mind? You got one I'm, minute. I, I might have something for you. Thank you. Thank you. No. Yeah, you Thank got you. one minute. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I want to, I, I need to go get a look at Manny. I need to see if he actually has any blood in him. Great. That's. I was hoping you would do that. <laughs> Give me... This is going to be a uh, first. Well, what I'm going to need from you then is a stability roll. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, am I supposed to do them one at a time and then add them? or? Yes, one at a time and then add them up. Okay. Okay, so I got a whoop, four and a two is a six. Okay. You are going to take a problem card. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> you are shaken. Okay. You see, you see Manny when you close your eyes because his body is in there. But it's not right. There's chunks missing. Oh, goodness. Sort of not cut off or like torn off like it would be in a car crash. And there's no blood coming out of them. But they look... Almost like very large bite marks, but not fangs or like canines or like like an animal that would make sense. They've all they've been like sloppily chewed off, almost like gummed off parts of like chunks of him all over his body, and he's just sitting there in the passenger seat or in the driver's seat rather. Be very weird if he was in the passenger seat. He's sitting in the driver's seat. Yes. <laughs> with these chunks taken out of him. And his body, there's these bloated pustules on him. And you swear you see runes 
or markings or letters like carved in him and there's these sloppy gum like bite marks on him and these pustules you back away and you blink but you feel like you're still looking right at it like you still see it clearly in your head Oof. you have taken a mythos shock problem okay <laughs> mythos shock so, uh, yeah, so this is a problem card, which you can take care of by spending edges that will come up as applicable to, uh, like, things that are not normal, to the abnormal. Okay. So you cannot, there are certain, problem cards might come up during play that are like, you get punched in the jaw, and you can take some time to just be like, ice your jaw and recover them. You cannot right. recover, like, this is not something like that. Okay. You just, you see it, you, like, you see it when you close your eyes. You're shaken up about it. Yes. Because it was extremely disturbing. Yeah. Not only that, I knew him. Yes. We didn't always see eye to eye, but that doesn't mean that, you know, anyone should look like that when they're dead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, uh, I kind of take a couple steps away from the car, um, kind of staring at it turn around and uh it i just janice thanks that was that was all i needed to see and i i'm just gonna walk past her without waiting for anybody to say anything because there's also a bottle of whiskey in the bottom drawer of my desk and i'm pretty sure i need some right now that's fair so we cut we cut to the desk you're, you're upending the bottle right <laughs> yeah i didn't bother with a glass i'm just <laughs> chugging some Put it down, wipe my Duke mouth. Eng Whew. Duke English comes back out. He's his steps are a little wobbly. Yeah. <laughs> you get the sense that he didn't stop drinking when you left. Right. <laughs> He's looking at you. He's looking at you. Rough morning on the society beat. Staring back at him. Yeah. You could say that. Heard some names this morning. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of lot of people in those society pages, and he looks at you just blank faced. Like, he sobers up real quick. Ah. Uh, look, you, uh... You, you get the sense. You, you immediately get the sense that he's hiding something. With your, asses your, asses your, your skill at assessing honesty tells you that he's... Yes. <laughs> he's hiding something. Hmm. Look, Duke, uh... I feel like you're not being straight with me about what happened to Manny. You, uh... You've always been a, a good man and a, a good boss to work for. I, uh, I'm really surprised that you're, you're keeping things from me like this. I, I thought we had a better relationship than that. You, you see, like, his eyes start to water again, and he starts, his lip starts to quiver, and he just says, like, I'm, I'm not hiding anything from, I'm not, he was just a stupid kid. He went poking around. He didn't, he shouldn't have. Shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have been there. And he, like, walks off. But you see something. Yeah. Just before you walk off. You rec You see... Duke English. He's old... Like, this older, like, Irish gent. Irish-American gent. And he's got... He's just sort of big, burly, kind of a... A real classic, you know, newspaper, 30s editor type. Like a Perry White type. Yeah. And he starts to, like, back up and walk. He, like, walks off. He leaves the office. But you, but real quick, before he leaves, you notice that he's got this real nice class ring. And you've never looked, you've never really given it a second look before. You just figured it was from wherever he went to school. Yeah. But you look at it, and it's got this weird, it doesn't look like a school crest on it. The, the insignia on the ring. And then you, you're like, you know you've seen that somewhere before. And, uh poster or like a like a, in an art piece or like a sketch in a notebook i start frantically leafing through the notebook <laughs> that manny left you see an insignia you see the same insignia yeah and it just says goodman it says sons of goodman sons of take another swig of whiskey because uh, i need a little bit of liquid courage right now <laughs> hmm. I'm gonna get up and follow Duke Duke out of here. 
Okay, uh, make me a shadowing challenge. Yeah. A shadowing roll. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, dice going off the table. <laughs> Five. Five. Great. You follow him a, a little bit behind. He sort of idly, drunkenly is walking around, like just strolling around the streets, kind of like head in his hands. Is You can't tell if he's walking off the, uh, walking off the booze or walking off his conscience. Right. But he's walking around, and he walks to the Gold Feather building. This is, uh, like a stock off, like a big stock office. This is where, uh, Kincaid works. This is where St. Swithin's used to work. This is where a lot of these guys used to work. This is one of those big, you know, like, glammy Wall Street offices. Sure. He it's walks a, up. A place that, having taken over the society beat... <laughs> I expect to spend some time. Yeah. He walks up there and he just stands there and Anderson, the doorman, kind of greets him a little bit coldly, Mm -hmm. but like gives, and he just keeps walking and he walks around for a little while longer and he comes back and he just starts walking in this circle and he's like, at one point he like takes a step in and Anderson opens the door a little bit and he just walks back off and he's trying to get the courage to walk inside, but he's not working hmm well i mean this is kind of my beat i could just go in and see if Uh, i could yeah anderson like (laughs) stops you before you walk in (laughs) he's 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 a he's he's big he's a mountain of a man okay and he stops you and he's like uh do you have business here this is a place this is a place of business not open to the public yes um, yes, indeed. No, I'm taking over for Manny, you may remember, um, from the Herald. And I'm sorry, is that the name of my newspaper? I suddenly forgot. Yeah, he starts to break out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He starts okay. to break. Well, Anderson breaks out in a cold sweat as soon as you say Manny. Right. Yeah. So, um, I mean, un- there was a really unfortunate accident. Um, I'm taking over his beat uh, for the Herald. And uh, I was actually hoping that I might be able to uh, speak with uh, Mr. Kincaid today. So, um you know, I'm, I'm just trying to finish up a couple of things because, um, you know, it was a very tragic accident. It happened very suddenly. Uh, we need to get some stuff in the society pages for tomorrow. Uh, so I'm hoping that I might just be able to just a few minutes of his time to just get something down on paper there. He is sweating bullets as he leans in and whispers to you. Mm-hmm. You say there was an ex man. He was in an accident. Is he? He's, he's OK, though, right? Um, I'm, I'm really... I'm really sorry to tell you this. He he's not okay. He's um they, he he's actually dead. No 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 no. Oh, they didn't. They didn't. Cops didn't say they found anything on him, like uh, like notes or notepads or anything, did they? Like like, he didn't. They didn't find anything on him, right? Cause. I mean, I mean, we never talked or anything, but I knew him, like, but I didn't, I just want to make sure that, um. Well, you know, I, I didn't, um, they didn't, they didn't tell me anything about any notepads or anything they found on him. So, uh, I mean, if that's, uh, that's a problem for you, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's a little weird that you just asked me that. Oh, yeah, you're right. I was just, my brain is just going and Uh he kind of, um, (laughs) he kind of stands up straight and like adjusts his, his doorman's outfit and he says, uh, Mr. Kincaid is in an office retreat at the moment uh, with some of the other investors. So, uh, unfortunately, you will not be able to interview him today. And he, like, he gently kind of grabs you by the arm and turns you away from the, the building. And he says, listen, please don't tell anybody that uh, Manny and I spoke. I don't know what, like, I, it's important to my job that Manny and I never had spoken. Okay. That's, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Anderson, by the way. Thank you. Uh, um, it's nice to meet you, Anderson. I, it sounds like I'm going to be around here a lot since I'm taking over for him. But, um, can you tell me why it's a problem that you spoke to him? I mean, you're a doorman. I'm just expecting that you speak to all kinds of people all, all day long. He looks around. He looks around. He makes sure that there's no one within earshot. And it's very quiet around the gold feather building sure and he leans in and he says you probably no never no it's 
Manny and I had an arrangement one night. We made a deal. Uh, money changed hands. In exchange, I looked the other way. He came in to the building. Uh, it was obviously a failing for my job, and I can't let that information go or else I will lose my job. And Kincaid, he is harsh about firings. Let me just ask you one more question. When you say harsh about firings, do you mean normal harsh, like you get fired? Or do you mean someone puts you in a car with a brick on the gas pedal and sends you directly to another car and makes it look like a car accident? Oh, they didn't. He stands up, straightens out his outfit, puts a hand on the door, and just says, I think you need to move along. But he hands you a slip of paper. Brilliant. It, it says on it, it is the name of, it says, the New York Metro Library, <laughs> Clarice Jones, and it has a phone number on it. Clarice Jones. So I will nod at him for the piece of paper and then act like he's kicked me out and I'm very offended by it. And I don't even know, like, as so as he's pushing me into the street, and I don't even know how you expect me to cover this building if you won't even let me in. <sighs> and he's, he's smiling as he's like, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> we'll talk to you when we want to talk. We'll talk to the press when we want to talk to the press. I brush my and he gives you, trench coat gives you a off. nod. <laughs> wink at him and walk away <laughs> um the new york metro library huh mm -hmm. i think i'm just gonna i'm gonna flag myself a taxi and i'm just gonna head over to the library right now okay uh clarice is working behind the front desk she is a bespectacled woman she's got a little uh like a little ponytail she's got a stack of books in her hands She's kind of not really paying attention to the front desk as she's, like, filing books away. Okay. I, uh, walk up to the front desk, wait for a second, see if she notices me, and then, since she's clearly actually preoccupied, reach over and ring the little bell. Ding! She, she jumps with a start. Hello! Welcome to the library! What can I do for you? I'm so sorry to bother you. Um, you're, you clearly got uh, a lot of really important things going on. Um, I got, um, I'm looking for a Clarice Jones. Yes, that's me. Uh, is there something that you needed? Um, yes, I, um, I was pointed in your direction. I'm, I'm looking for some information about, uh, well, to be quite honest, about a, a, a man named Quincy Goodman. And she, uh, she starts sweating bullets. <laughs> she says, did Anderson send you? Yeah, look, he did, but I don't want to get him in trouble by telling you that. I, no, just, he's got to stop doing that. He's going to get me in trouble, and he's going to get himself in trouble. He's, I love him, but he's not, he's too nice. He needs to be harder if he's going to survive. Yeah, it sounds like things are pretty, uh pretty rough around the gold feather building is my impression is this not the first time that he's sent someone to you for some more information this is the second time that he is, is uh second time he sent someone my way um the first time was like, manny it's the mm -hmm. you know him i did yeah right did that mm -hmm. makes sense that checks out <laughs> all so... right come on let's go to the back we'll talk in the back <laughs> All right. <laughs> she walks you to the back office. She puts up like a, we'll be back in five minutes sign. Yeah. She sits down. So you're looking into the Goodman business. I am looking into the Goodman business. I, uh, I already uh, met Alistair this morning, and um, this seems to go all over the place. Am I wrong? It's, I've been writing my thesis on this, and it's, it's, it's actually, it's honestly fascinating, but like the more... But, like, lately, like, since I started dating Anderson, like, things are starting to 
it stopped being fun for me to write this thesis after I started dating him. It started, she started talking to me about stuff. Ah. And she, she lights up a cigarette and she's like, yeah, I... He was like an old cult leader, right? Like, he was just an old weird guy with who hung out with a bunch of other old weird guys and they sat around smoking pipes and laughing about how great it was to own land. Right, except that uh, he wasn't just that, really, was he? You know, for I, I was, my thesis was based strictly on, like, his life and how he was, he was playing on fears to drum up money and how he was, like, making all of, how he was, how he was running. He was, he was America's first con man, as I described him, but no, I don't think he was that. And I think you need to be careful if you're going to look into this any further, because honestly, I'm thinking I might switch majors. <laughs> You catch my drift. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, look, um, everybody keeps telling me to be careful, but my friend Manny is dead out there, and uh, <laughs> there's something really weird going on here, and, and my business is the truth. So, you know, I, I will do my best, but any information you can give me, I, I would appreciate greatly. And she, she listens to what you're saying, and she breathes heavily. She takes a deep drag of her cigarette. And she kind of slumps over a little bit. She slumps down. She sags her shoulders. And she's like, you know what? It's your problem now. And she goes, she, she goes to a file cabinet, mm-hmm. pulls out an old leather-bound book and, like, a stack of papers and her thesis, mm-hmm. drops it in your lap. I, I'm switching majors after all. I, I can't do this anymore. All right. Well, good luck. Thank you. You too. We'll both need it. Hmm. All right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my. I am so sitting here at this desk with these papers in front of me and this old book, um, sitting here looking at it, having flashes in my mind of <laughs> how I just saw Manny and um, feeling a little trepidatious about it. I'm going to start with her thesis. Okay. Yeah, her thesis is about what she said it was, about, like, how he was a con man and about how a lot of the the visuals that he was describing about, like, this primordial version of ourselves that we needed to unleash and we needed to harness such that we might live forever. Uh, how it was all, like, playing on fears and anxieties of the early American settlers. And about how he was very good at drawing on those kind of fears in order to drum up business. Sure. I mean, it seems pretty reasonable, except that I I saw some weird stuff today. Okay. It's been a weird day. Yeah. So there was the thesis, and then there were some loose papers, right? Yeah. Uh, Which a lot of them are her, like, drawing, like, name maps between various people. And one of them, you look at one of them, it is a list of people that were on the... Uh, the Saint Martha, which was one of these old pilgrim ships, right? Settled settled in New Amsterdam. Uh, you look, you're looking it over, and it's it's one of those old charters, so it has the list of all the names. Yeah, like you're looking through it, and it's just this long list of old, like old pilgrim names, like Eobard Fletcher. Okay, Fletcher, huh? Marvin Kincaid. Uh huh. Quincy Goodman. Any Englishes on that ship? Lucas when Lucas Saint Swithins. Mm hmm. Henry English. Well. <laughs> All right. Um. So I'm gonna set that list to the side. Take a deep breath, cause I am not sure what I am into. And. Open the cover of this book. You're you're flipping through the book. It is the writings of Quincy Goodman. Yeah. It is all about how we need to unleash ourselves. How there is there is a thing inside each of us, ancient and eternal, and we too can be ancient and eternal if we just indulge it. And it's these long things about how we are 
dangling above an abyss that we are that is unknowable unknowable and and infinite and it is only the 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 Krakatoa the mind demon within us that keeps us from going and it's a lot of like the it's it's a it's a lot of exclusionist like outsiders are not to be trusted there's a lot of it's a it, there's a lot of a lot of grossness in it yeah and you're reading it and you're seeing these these diagrams and these these things these big long screeds about how everyone is damned and everyone is keeping the pure from being okay and like it's you feel your skin just creeping and you feel like it's you can feel you can hear this you can hear his voice screaming these things in your ear and you hear it echoing through the whole building even though you know it's dead quiet in here I'm going to need another stability roll. Mm-hmm. Four plus three is seven. Okay. You, you, you shake it off. You know that this is just an old, hateful old man's hateful old screeds. Yeah. Some crazy but, people clearly have fallen in with us still, but... But you know that, like, you see these rituals and these symbols and these runes and you close your eyes and you realize that those are the runes that were on Manny. Yes. So I sit back in the chair for a moment and I'm no longer looking at the book. I'm looking at the ceiling and I'm having a moment where I'm trying to figure out exactly what to do. And then I shut the book with a snap and I put Clarice's papers on top of it. I'm going to head out of the library. You know what? Let me actually... Mm. Let me actually do a push on that book first. Okay. Yeah. You... There there are some drawings in the book. Some illustrations. One of Krakatoa, the mind demon. It is growing out of a human form. And it is this thing and its face is ragged its mouth is malformed and it's like got teeth but they're sort of rounded and not right they don't look right it looks like it's just got this open giant thing of maw of gums and it's covered in pustules and it's like emerging out of a person and again like you see that the cover of that book is the same logo that was on in the notebook that was on his ring and you see that this for this is a first this is a, an old old book this is a first edition this belonged to a mr kincaid okay mm. having paused to look at the book one more time this time i really am gonna close it mm-hmm. and put clarice's notes on it and i'm gonna walk out of the library hail myself a taxi and I'm heading back to the office. Okay. That piece of paper and that was on your desk is gone. Oh, boy. <laughs> Duke's, Duke's, door, Duke's door is closed. Oh. Oops. <laughs> okay. Um, his door is closed, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I am... I'm going to call Janice. Janice. Okay. <laughs> Why yeah. can't I say that name? I'm going to call Janice. And I'm hoping that she's still there. Or that she's back in the police station. She's at her desk. She's at uh, Janice. Janice. Uh, Janice Dole. Janice. It's um, it's Vivian Sinclair. Uh, you got a second? Hey, you. Yeah. Look. Um, and I'm looking at Duke's closed door. Well, I'm saying this to make sure it doesn't open. Um, I uh, I've been doing some uh, been doing some research on on some of those stranger circumstances about uh, how you found Manny this morning. Um, yeah, just let me close my door real quick, and she like closes yeah. it, and you hear you hear that big thud of a lock. Right. Look. Um. Actually, is there any chance we could talk in person? I'm I'm not yeah. sure this is a really safe place for me to tell you anything. Yeah, uh, there's a deli around the corner from the precinct. Um, yeah, we'll meet meet there in half hour. Sure, that sounds great. 
uh, you can buy me a coffee for the legwork. Beautiful, perfect. Two of you. So we cut. We cut to the. We cut to the office. You're both. You're sitting. Like you both have coffees. Yes. She's kind of stirring <laughs> it slowly and idly, like looking down in the coffee itself. Right. So I. Uh, and I'm basically, like in brief rehashing for her the trail that mm-hmm. I've been following today. Um, so look, I. Uh, I know this sounds crazy. Um, and I don't know what you're going to find when you look at Manny. And, and I'm hoping that, you know, you've got him, you've got the body so that you can verify what I'm telling you. But uh, I think that, you know, Alistair St. Swivens and, and maybe Kincaid and, and actually maybe Duke English and possibly uh, Chet Fletcher, Fletcher might be involved in this situation just based on what I'm finding and how weird they have all been about this. And she's, she's like, do you have, like, you're making big claims. Do you have proof? Well, it depends on what kind of proof you want. Um, you know, I, uh... <laughs> hmm, do I have proof? Hmm, let me think about that for a second. Yeah, yeah, you've, you've got, you've, I, I think you've yeah. got, you've probably got in your notebook, like, at least, right. like, the list of names. That's right, I got the list of names and, and you know, maybe a, a quick sketch of the... Um, runes that I saw in, in mm-hmm. Quincy Goodman's book um, mm-hmm. that matched the ones that I saw in Manny. <laughs> a little shakier because yeah, so I was a little freaked you're, out. You're, flip, you're showing her these things. You show her yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the the Goodman symbol. Yeah. She's like, that's like, does that's uh, Chet's class ring, though. Like, that's... Right, seen, yeah, I've except that, that it's, it's actually Duke English's class ring, too. But did they go to the same school? No, he went to the police academy. Wait. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I'm listening. So look, and I'm I'm gonna push the the notebook across at her again, and and flip to the page that has the runes on it. So look look at these. So I've you saw those. the body, right? Yeah, I've seen those. Those are on him. Yeah, those. Are, <laughs> I saw them too. Trust me. I I I uh, I kind of can't stop seeing them. But yeah, me neither. This is uh, these ones. I uh. I traced out of that Quincy Goodman book I just saw at the library. So what do we do? I was kind of hoping you might have an idea, because I got to tell you, I have no idea. I mean, I can write an article about this, and then so that's good as far as it goes, but no one will believe me, and uh, I'll probably end up dead. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, so, okay. We have to go to gold. We have to go to Goldfeather. Yeah, maybe you can get in, because I can't get in. Yeah, I can get us in. I'm a cop. I can yeah. get us in wherever we need to go. Um, Yeah. Probably don't want to... C- okay, no, we should go alone. I don't trust... I, I'm not sure I trust. I'm not sure okay. I trust anybody. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll be frank. I'm not 100% sure I trust you, but you seem pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I... Um, Gotta trust somebody these days. Nobody, Nobody's perfect, but I think I'm all right. All right, let's go. I don't think there's a better time than right now. All right. Let's do this. So you load into the car with Janice. Yeah. And you drive over. Yeah. Anderson sees the two of you and he opens the door. He doesn't say a word. Uh-huh. You're oh there. <laughs> You're there with her when she talks to the front desk. You're there with her when they she pushes through and goes up to the central conference room. Where yeah. she finds that everyone is having their team retreat, so to speak. Yes. Uh, and you're there with her when the door opens. And you see everyone in a circle. Robes. Runes on the floor. And Quincy Goodman is there in the middle of the room. Or Krakatoa is there. In the middle of the room. Guns start blaring. Screams. Panic. But none of that really matters. I'm going to need you to make one last stability roll. Yep. (laughs) Three. Plus one. (laughs) No, it is the best dramatic way for this to go. 
Oh, uh, you get a setback. You get a problem card okay. that is uh, broken by the image of Quincy. Okay. In the days following the gold feather incident, there were a number of arrests due to varying a, a litany of crimes. Right. It, it seems like it's a, a an okay ending. There's a, a corruption. There's re-elections in the off in the, in the police office. Uh, there's some org shifts in the Herald Tribune. The Gold Feather Building is completely restocked. Mm-hmm. Restaffed, rather. But uh, unfortunately, Vivian Sinclair doesn't get to see a lot of that because they don't allow, uh, like they don't allow a lot of outside news in the treatment facility. Yep. <laughs> But on the days when she's lucid enough, she can be seen with a smile for a moment or two here or there. Because she knows the truth. She know she saw she saw Quincy die. Mm-hmm. But did she see Krakatoa die? And that's game. Oh man! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah! That was good. That was really good. Oh my god, I'm so happy with that. That was awesome. I oh. love it. <laughs> I mean, it is the most appropriate enemies you have to go crazy at the end of a Cthulhu oh. game. <sighs> oh, I was really happy with how that turned out. Oh my gosh, that was fun. That, no, was, that was fun. great. <laughs> what a what a good game. <laughs> oh. oh, thank you so much for running it. Oh, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a blast. <laughs> Absolutely. So, real quick before we wrap up, where can people find your work online? Um, you can find me, well, you can find me on Twitter at Idella Mifflin, which is I-D-E-L-L-A-M-I-T-H-L-Y-N-N-D. And I know that that's impossible to spell. So you can also find me at Sass Geek Podcast or at Pandas Talk Games. Um, and those are the other two podcasts. You can find She's a Super Geek at SassGeek.com. And you can find Pandas Talking Games at uh, MisdirectedMark.com, where we are one of the network there as well. That's pretty much me in a nutshell. <laughs> Fabulous. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was amazing. And I'm going to throw it over to me in the future so that he can wrap up with the show. Awesome. Take it, future me. Thanks, past me. And thanks again to Senda for coming on to the show. That was so good. I cannot believe how much fun that was. Speaking of things that are good and fun, you should also check out She's a Super Geek and Pandas Talking Games. They are great podcasts. I cannot recommend them enough. A link to both shows can be found in the show notes. You can also follow Senda on Twitter at Idella Mithland. It's in the show notes. Don't worry, I got you covered. As well as Sass Geek and Pandas Talk Games. Then, while you're on Twitter, you can follow Party of One at Party of One Pod. Like the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Party of One Podcast. If you love the show, consider telling a friend. iTunes reviews, social media shoutouts, and word of mouth recommendations help the show do bigger, better, and cooler things. You can also consider backing us on Patreon. Patreon backers get early access to unedited episode audio. They get access to my designer's notes for games that are not designed for two players, as well as behind-the-scenes material like character sheets and adventure prep material. You can find that at patreon.com slash partyofonepodcast. If you want to hear a little more from me, you can also check out All My Fantasy Children, the podcast in which Aaron Catano and I take your listener prompts and turn them into beautiful, thriving, vibrant role-playing game characters. <laughs> Party of One is produced and edited by Jeff Stormer and Jen Frank. All music for the show comes from the song Infinite Lives by Mega Ran featuring the D&D Sluggers. If you'd like to inquire about advertising rates or about coming onto the show, shoot me an email at partyofonepodcast at gmail.com. Well, that's it for me, party people. Thank you so much for listening. Remember to fight the rising tide of fascism worldwide. And as always, party on. Never gonna die.